Science is a way of finding out the stories that nature tells about itself. But nature is not the best conversationalist. I like to think about it this way. When you go to a new city and you come out of the airport and you get into a taxi cab, often the taxi cab driver is not a native English speaker. And the taxi driver wants to share with you their story and they start talking to you. Uh, and you really want to participate in this. It's a chance to find out something really cool about some place you've never been by talking to this person. But even though they're technically speaking English, it's often very hard to understand what they're saying. And that can be because the English that they're using just isn't quite the same as the English that native English speakers use. And so they put the words in different places in the sentence or they put the emphasis in just completely the wrong place. And then you don't really know quite what they were saying. And you have to really think about it and pay close attention to the words that they're saying. And where should that word have come in the sentence? The other reason, though, is, almost, is much more profound. And that's because the cab driver is often describing to you a world of which you have no experience that's very different from the world that you normally inhabit. And so even if you understand the words that they say, and you sit and you listen to that sentence, and you say, yes, I knew that word. Yes, I knew that word. Yes, I knew that word. Now I put them all together, and I still don't know what it meant. This is the experience of doing science sometimes. So nature is using a language we understand only incompletely, and at the same time, describing a universe that is so much bigger than our experience that we have a very hard time translating the physical universe onto our own mental and emotional map that we've built from our own personal experiences. You are seeing only a tiny fraction of the light that's in this room right now. And you are hearing only a tiny fraction of the sound in this room right now. You have interacted with a tiny fraction of possible masses, and you have traveled at only a tiny fraction of possible speeds. The universe is much, much bigger than your experience of it. So when we try to take the entire, the entire physical universe and map it onto the experience of human beings, this is a really complex and complicated thing to do. But it's what science is all about. Understanding this story and translating this story is particularly hard when we're talking about nature's creation story. The story that goes all the way back to the very beginning. What we know of the story so far goes something like this. There was a beginning of both time and infinite space. And I see you, and you're thinking, Oh, I understood those words, <laughs> but I'm not sure I understand what she means, right? And of course, of course, that is very hard. Even just the word infinite, which you have undoubtedly struggled with at some point in your life, you have thought to yourself, self, if I traveled off in that direction, and then I kept going, and then I kept going, and then I went some more, and then I did that whole thing again, and then one more time, there would still be further to go than I had gone. Even if you've spent time struggling with that concept, you probably still can't quite fit it into the head that is yours. But you'll notice that there's also something else I said. I said it was the beginning of time. The beginning of time means that there was no before. And that is messed up. <laughs> right? Because you have no place in your head that has no before in it. So I can stand here and I can say to you sentences that are very simple. You know every single word in that sentence and you still don't know what it means. And figuring out what it means is the really tricky part. 10 to the minus 47 seconds, that's 0 0.0000, 46 of those, one seconds after the Big Bang happened, we can tell you what the universe was like. 
And we can tell you that because we reason by analogy. We create similar conditions inside of instruments uh, here on Earth, and we create conditions that we can extrapolate into temperatures and densities that were like the temperatures and densities at that time. And we can say, ah, now we know what the universe was like at that time. I can tell you it was very hot and it was very dense. It was so hot and dense, in fact, that there were no particles at all at that early, early time. The universe began to expand, and then you just fell down again. Because it was infinite, and then it got bigger. <laughs> and no matter how many times I talk to you about number lines, and I say, well, it goes from 0 to 1, and then 2 and 3, and oh, that's infinite, right? And we, yeah, we got the number line, OK. And then we go and we say, how many fractions are there? And in your head, you move the 0 and the 1 so you can fit the fractions in there. That's what the universe is doing. The galaxies are moving apart like the numbers on the number line, and there's more stuff in between all the time. The universe is expanding. The universe expanded, and the temperature dropped, and the density dropped, and they dropped low enough that particles could exist, and light started making particles, but didn't let them stay around very long, and they self-annihilated. Eventually, the temperature dropped enough, and the density dropped enough that the particles could stick around. Well, that was kind of exciting. At that point, the universe really looked like a big, dense fog. It was whew, right here. Could not see your hand in front of your face. The temperature continued to drop, and the density continued to drop until it was low enough that the negative particles could get together with the positive particles, and they could make atoms. And this is an incredible moment in the history of the universe. At this moment, when the temperature is exactly so, the universe becomes transparent for the first time. Light can travel through it. So the fog starts to move back from you. The longer time goes by, the further away the fog has gone. At this point in the universe, right now, that fog is 13.7 billion light years from us. And the light from that location in the universe is just now showing up here. We can catch it, we can study it, we can examine it, we can know what the universe was like when it was very, very young by studying this light from the moment at which it became transparent. <laughs> and we feel pretty good about ourselves. <laughs> That's pretty nice. Gravity is all that's needed, really, to make galaxies and stars. Once the universe has expanded uh, for a while, the densities fall, and you can start to actually get these mm, overdense spaces that collapse and form uh, galaxies and stars. In order to fit this into our mental map when we're talking about stars, we talk about them as though they're born and they live and they die. This is a metaphor that we use so that we can map something so miraculous onto our own personal experience. Stars are born and they live and they die, but it takes them a lot longer than it takes people. And frankly, they do it with a lot less drama. <laughs> so. This has happened, actually, with two generations of stars before the sun was born four and a half billion years ago. How do we know? We know because nature keeps a record of every star that has ever lived and died. Nature keeps that record in the atoms that make up the universe. As stars are born and they live and they die, they take the hydrogen and helium that was there at the Big Bang and they turn it into other things on the periodic table. So those bits and pieces make up the Earth. When you look around you and you see carbon, that came from stars like the sun that have died. When you look around you and you see iron, that came from stars much more massive than the sun that have died. When you look at yourself, you come from stars that have died. This is not poetry. This is literal truth. You are made of star stuff. I find it actually a terrible, awful responsibility to try to live up to the night sky, 
to live up to that heritage. Atoms don't like to live by themselves in general. They like to get together with other atoms and form molecules. Those molecules are easy to make. They're all over the place. Space is infested with molecules. They're everywhere. Self-replicating molecules are somewhat harder, but they clearly happen. And it takes only one self-replicating molecule to begin to develop life. It takes one self-replicating molecule that reproduces and reproduces and reproduces and is very enthusiastic about it, and also very sloppy. So that the copies that it makes of itself are not perfect copies every time, but instead they're a little bit different every time. So that some of those copies do better in the heat, and some of those copies do better in the cold. The ones that are in the heat if they do better in the cold, well, they don't reproduce over there. They don't replicate. But the sturdy ones over there, they hang out and, and can handle the heat. They replicate a lot. And you get more and more and more of them. At some point, you take those molecules, those self-replicating molecules, and you stick them into a lump of, say, fatty acids. Um, Nature at the moment is giving us a number of different stories about cell membranes and how they form. This is just one possibility. Those self-replicating molecules wind up in a clump of fatty acids. It forms a membrane and protects that self-replicating molecule so it can make more and more and more and more and more of itself. As it goes, it's sloppy and it makes more different kinds of cells. The more cells you have, just by simple numbers, the more complex the groupings can become, the more complex the organisms you can make. The more cells you have, the more ways you can arrange them, like books on a bookshelf. If you have one book, it can only go in one order, <laughs> which is hopefully self-explanatory. <laughs> but if you have lots of books, they can go in lots of different orders. You can arrange them lots of different ways. And in the same way, if you have one cell, you can only do one thing. But if you have lots of cells, you can do lots of things. And so those cells may, turned into creatures. They collected together. And then those creatures became more and more complex. Some of those creatures developed opposable digits. Some of those creatures developed upright stature. Some of those creatures developed the ability to actually inquire of nature what the story is, and find out the answer. Some of those creatures, those very creatures, by the way, 90% of them isn't them. Only 10% of the cells in your body actually carry your DNA. Really? You're just a big bag for microbes. <laughs> And when I'm feeling completely overwhelmed by trying to live up to the night sky, I think about being a bag for microbes, <laughs> and I feel better. <laughs> so this is the story that nature tells us about how we got here. This is how we understand it now today, over 13.7 billion years, multiple lives and deaths of stars to bring us to the point where we sit right here now today and you can listen to me talk about the stories that nature tells. This creation story is different than other creation stories that we tell. And I want to point out three ways in which it's very different. The first is that in this particular story, we don't know everything. We don't have the full story but we can fill it in. And we do that every day. People work hard to fill in the details of the story. We don't know every single detail, but we're finding them out all the time. The second way that this story is different from other types of creation stories is that in this story, it's not all about you. Right? This is a different thing um, entirely, a different way of understanding where you come from. The third thing about this story I think is probably the most important point, and that is that this story is not finished. This story is still going on. Thing, the creation is still happening now, 
today, and we are part of it. We are not outside of nature. We are inside of nature, and we are actually changing it. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Geologists tell us that millions of years from now, other geologists will know that we were here. They will know that we were here because we've caused a mass extinction. They will know that we were here because we changed the climate. They will know that we were here because we dug up all the oil and we turned it into plastic and we wrapped the planet in it. They will know. We have done what is absolutely positively natural for a species to do in the face of abundant resources. We have multiplied and we have spread and we have consumed. Every year we run deeper in debt to nature by digging up the energy and the water that it took millions of years for nature to put underground. And we use it up at a rate millions of times faster than nature can replenish it. Every species in the past that has ever, ever gone through this completely natural phenomenon of expanding and spreading has gone through another completely natural phenomenon. Nature fixed it. When nature fixes things, it's not nice. Nature fixes things through famine and disease and pestilence and, in our case, probably war. That's how nature fixes things. And we have that to look forward to as the end of the story that nature tells about creation. But we have an advantage. It's a huge advantage. This is an advantage that no other species has ever had. We ask nature the question. We listen when nature tells the story. We know what nature has planned. We can see it coming. And that means we can change it. We can dream of a different future. We can dream of a different way. There are things that are worthy of your dreams, and then there are things that your dreams are worthy of. Are your dreams worthy of the night sky? I want to give you a challenge today to go dream a better ending to this story and then make it happen. Thank you. <laughs>